Uh, we want to uh, welcome and, and thank our friend uh, Diana Kose Hartel for being our guest today um, to uh, to talk about uh, bearing witness to watersheds. And uh, many of you know uh, Kose already. Uh, she's a Zen practitioner in the Soto lineage at Sweetwater Zen Center in San Diego, National City, to be precise. A trauma therapist, an environmental writer, artist, and uh, a, a Renaissance person, I think, if I could say that, Kose. I don't know. Hopefully that's fair. Um, I love the topic, that just, just a personal word, I love the topic of watersheds. Uh, I first was really introduced to this idea probably by Gary Snyder 50 or 60 years ago. Um, and, and it always came down to, do you know where your water comes from and do you know where it goes? And uh, living in the mountains, I'm fortunate to be able to identify that really clearly. I live on Six Mile Creek and I know where it goes. It goes into Left Hand Creek, which goes into the Poudre River, which goes in, into, the, the, uh, or into the Platte River and then into the Missouri River and into the Mississippi. And uh, Six Mile Creek is down at the bottom of a ridge below our house and on our property. And I wrote a piece, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and somewhat whimsically uh, suggested that I could go down there on a quiet day and stick my ear in the water and hear saxophone music coming back up from New Orleans. Now, of course, that was mostly fantasy, but I just loved that uh, almost somatic or tactile connection with my water. And uh, um, we've had well issues lately and um, you know, when your well goes dry, you're really in trouble. So, uh, so I, I'm really looking forward, uh, Kose, to your words. And that's enough from me. So I'm going to hand you the talking stick and mute myself and, and welcome you with much gratitude, Kose. Thank you so much. I'm really appreciative of this chance to share with everyone um, the watershed work bearing witness that uh, I spent many years doing. I've long been an environmental activist, but I especially uh, spent probably 10 years going around to various watersheds and speaking with people and writing about it. All, you know, um, a lengthy bearing witness of its history and not just the history that you can find in history books, but personal and my own personal history entwined. And this is, at the time also, I was a Zen practitioner and it was part of my practice. I spent a lot of years traveling and every time I crossed a waterway, I carried a, a special small chalice that I would raise to thank the water and that I was passing over. And um, that was that was something that really helped me to to see it more clearly I feel I really feel that and that that kind of even small ceremony is is very much part of what we do when we do bear witness to watersheds and when we do take action compassionate action so that's the heart of what I'm going to share today and I'm going to share it with all of you and ask you all for something in return as well. At the end, we'll do a bit of a litany where each one will speak the name of their own watershed. In turn, we'll go around, but that'll be at the end. And I'm so thrilled that so many people are here and that I know a lot of you uh, some I don't, but I am getting to know. And here we are, from west to east, north to south. We're all here. The um, um, I wrote this book, this one. It's called Watershed Redemption. That was the product, if you want to call it that, of my travels of bearing witness to watersheds. And I'm going to read some of this today. The uh, I. I finished it and was on a book tour just when the pandemic hit, which seems like way more than three years ago. You know? 
everything has changed so much and so much about the climate change has really become front page news daily almost. So the importance of water, especially in the West, cannot be understated. Um, when when I finished the book and I was starting, I, I got a van, I was gonna do another round of travels and write another book on the age of extinctions, which is what we're in. Um, but I never got to do that. I started by visiting Michael Sule, who as many of you might know. Um, he, he died about two years ago. He was a major conservationist and the first husband of Jan Chosen Bays. So I met him in Colorado at his home. He'd had a stroke, but he was still functional. And um, I asked him, like, what do we tell people? You know, what's, what is there for people who are just coming into this world that has so many issues in the environment, especially, uh, you know, what should they do? And, and is there hope? And he says, oh, no, it's over with. He says, we're done. We're cooked. And he said, um, he said in the 80s, he thought there was a chance to really turn things around. And um, I was surprised that he was so certain that this is it. We're done. And then um, I mentioned to him the California condor. California condor was nearly extinct in, I think, 1987. There were 27 individuals left. And Michael Sule was on the first condor team that captured those remaining condors, brought them to the San Diego Wildlife Zoo. And Los Angeles was also part of this. And they began a breeding program. So there were no condors left in the wild. They were only in captivity in this breeding program. And um, he, he was since he was on that very first condor program, I, I said to him, hey, did you know there are over 500 now? And he just stops, his jaw drops. He hadn't heard the numbers. And he says, they're going to make it. You know, OK. Yeah, in the context of, oh, we're cooked, it's over with, we're done. You know, he still held that joy in seeing the condors coming back. So I hold those two things too. The, the difficult things we're seeing, the massive destruction, and those moments of breakthrough and joy, um, the work of people that work so tirelessly, not even knowing the outcome of what that work is. He didn't know. So I take those two threads with us uh, through, through, through this presentation. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, I'm going to take excerpts from two chapters out of this book. I hope you don't mind me reading sections. The first is um, the Upper Mississippi. And I um, especially chose that because the folks just now coming back from the Black Hills from a bearing witness retreat. So this chapter I wrote on the Upper Mississippi includes a period of um, the Standing Rock, the, the No Dapple Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, I was there for some of it and I wrote about it, but um, I also wrote about the background of, of what's going on in the Upper Mississippi. And this is called, um, what did I call it? <laughs> it's a good title, whatever it is. I called it Immortal River, Mortal Soil. And it's especially important because of the very short period of destruction of the lands of the Upper Mississippi that um, has had anyway some of the richest soil on earth when before settlers arrived it was the richest soil on earth and a lot of it still is and there is restoration going on but the story of destruction is a really big issue and my own family story is in it so and this is what i've been doing examining my own family history you know what role 
did that play in what happened as, as history unfolded um, in all of it, the destruction, the restoration, all of it. So let me begin here. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes? Okay. <laughs> all right. Let me start with um, a poem by John Trudell, who is a Santee, uh, was a Santee Dakota one of my favorite writers and activists. He says, Crazy Horse, we hear what you say. One earth, one mother. One does not sell the earth. The people walk upon, we are the land. How do we sell our mother? Yeah. So the upper Mississippi used to have a natural waterfall. It still exists in paintings only. Painting by Bierstadt and George Catlin, romanticized brush strokes of a captured moment, but it can no longer be found on the river itself. St. Anthony Falls in Minneapolis ceased to be a natural falls under a series of botched engineering hydropower feats for lumber, textile, and flour mills, among them Pillsbury, operating from, from 1881 to 2003. Below the falls, meeting grounds for trade between indigenous nations, nesting places of eagles on Spirit Island, and the Dakota Nation councils at Carver's Cave no longer exist. St. Anthony, the intercessor for lost things and the patron saint of Father, Father Hennepin, the first European visitor in 1679 to the falls and to the now vanished town at the center of the Dakota's traditional lands, has much work to do. The um, Upper Mississippi and her vast webs of water, above and below ground, from the Rockies to the Alleghenies, from Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota, to the confluence of the Ohio at Cairo, Illinois, and all the way down to the Gulf. Witness losses for the indigenous people there, European infectious diseases, decimation of native foods and disposition, dispossession from homelands changed their world. If they survived, most were forced into poverty-stricken camps, the government calls reservations. The upper Mississippi received increasing tonnages of soil from erosion and toxic wastes from farm cities and industries, coursing down its watery veins to all the interconnected communities of fish, animals, plants, insects, birds, and people once European settlers took over the land. Now, some of my relatives did that. They were part of the settlers taking over the land in Minnesota. So the story of the Upper Mississippi culminates an important movement for indigenous rights to clean water and undisturbed homeland. In parallel to indigenous rights, the environmental movement to halt destruction and restore the land grows every year. And yes, it still does, in spite of the news you read. It really is. We bear witness to the most recent turn of this centuries-long struggle as an action to block an environmentally destructive crude oil pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, on the banks of the Missouri, a major tributary of the upper mess, this story, 338 years after Father Hennepin's voyage, now called South St. Paul, has complex roots, including my own family history, entwined in the telling. In the bottom lands of the Mississippi watershed can be found the historically richest soil in North America, supporting vast and diverse biological ecosystems. Before the river was bound in concrete by the Army Corps of Engineers and separated from so much of its floodplain, the Mississippi River floodwaters gathered natural nutrients from the land to mix with suspended river sediments 
as the river overflowed its banks. The waters roared and churned, settled and receded. It changed course many times, leaving plant and animal organic matter throughout the floodplain, in wetlands, ponds, and lakes appearing for variable lengths of time. We call these ancient cycles of flooding naturally disrupted species habitat and nutrient renewal spread over millennia, the river's flood pulses. They're essential to the life of the river and to the life of the river lands. They underlie the region's historical fertility and species diversity, renewing the watershed ecosystem by taking life and giving back even more life. The Mississippi River bears as many names as there are nations who have lived in its watershed. Some names translate as mother of waters, big river, great river, but those names are used in many other powerful rivers as well. The unique name for the Mississippi translates as the river outside of time. For it is outside of human time, going back more than 10,000 years in its present form. After the retreat of the great ice sheets, we glimpse its earlier history in carbon dated sediment from 55,000 years ago. Some call it the immortal river as we cannot see its beginning or its end. In the river's headwaters, the river shapes itself into a long question mark visible from space. The name for its headwater lake Itasca comes from truth in Latin, but Elk Lake Omashkuzu Zagayigan in the language of the Anishinaabe is its name for the people who first lived here. These people and the Dakotas to the south and west inhabited the land before Europeans arrived such a short period from European arrival when the history there of people is 10,000 years or more. The, the name we use for the Mississippi comes from uh, the Anishinaabe. It's from, they named the three segments of the river they knew, and the one from the Crow Wing River to the Gulf is the name we use. Mrs. Zibi, Mississippi. While the river may be called immortal, the soil proved mortal once settlers busted the deep sod that had been forming for centuries. Through all eras, the Mississippi flows, reshaping the surface geology. How did so much of the river become corseted in concrete and the land degraded? the water's poison, we know, don't we? And what of its restoration? The first step was to, to dispossess indigenous tribes, survey it into rectilinear sections of 648 acres, establish townships and county lines along the gridded surveys, and sell parcels of those sections to homesteaders who knew little or nothing of sustainable farming in the upper Mississippi watershed. Most had come from Europe, most not necessarily farmers, even if they were farmers from Europe, they knew European farming and not the Mississippi, its climate and its soil. Like a rapid succession of unexpected hundred year floods, European descended settlers radically reshaped the lives of the occupants of the land and retold the story of the watershed. My maternal grandfather's line followed a common settler path from Europe to Minnesota, then onto the Rockies and Sierras in the West. My family was unaware the original geographic center of the Dakota Nation could be found in the confluence of the Mississippi and the Minnesota rivers. We still use the Dakota word for Minnesota, Minnesota Makote land where the water reflects the clouds. This place includes what is now Mankato, where my maternal grandfather was born in 1883, 
shortly after the Dakota Nation's dispossession after 1862. Now, Mankato is an important place for there was the hanging of 38 Dakota men under the orders of Abraham Lincoln in 1862. It was punishment for what people referred to as the Sioux Wars. And it was just, it was in, and it was occurred during the Civil War where thousands of European descended people were killing each other. So this was done in order to dispossess people from those lands and to place settlers in to hold the land for, for the US government purposes of all kinds, mostly about money and power. So I looked into how was it seen? How was all of this seen in history by the Dakota or Lakota, they're, they're in the same language groups. Um, how was that seen? And the way we can look at that is through records kept called winter counts or ledger narratives. Typically a new pictograph was added um, in each year, drawn on hides and passed down through a lineage of winter count keepers. The counts can be dated to the Western calendar years given an event known as the year the stars fell. There was a great Leonid meteor shower of 1883-1833 that is found on nearly all winter counts covering that time. Originally the counts or ledgers were tribe or band histories, though with changes due to the diaspora post-contact, counts began to follow a more narrow family narrative and were drawn on ledger paper. They no longer did it on hides. One of the longest counts comes from a winter count keeper named Batiste Good, or Brown Hat, and covers the years from 1700 to 1879. Now he's a lineage count keeper, so his the people before him had been keeping these counts and he he carried it on Good was born in 1823, and we know that because of a comet that streaks through the sky, making a loud noise that appears in the winter counts. He was a Chicago and lived on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota in the 1880s until he died in 1907. The dates of his lifespan closely match my maternal second great-grandfather, Moses DeWolf, who died at the end of 1902, four years before Good died. Rivers figure throughout the winter counts, mainly as in, in before the arrival of the settlers or the whites. Mainly they show up, the river shows up as floods or ice or winter camp locations. There were fights with other tribes, not massive death, but deaths of important chiefs or prominent band members, dances and ceremonies. They're all in pictographs kept on these counts. The dates of my own maternal grandfather's line, I can actually place them in the midst of Batiste Good's winter counts related to the arrival of the whites. So I'm going to read to you how the counts kept track of a white White's arrival and influence. The first note was in 1707. Many kettle winter, got three guns and many pots from an English trader. These, of course, are translated from, from these, the count data. I believe the Smithsonian keeps these records. It, 1708, brought home Omaha horses. So horses start to appear in the counts after this. They weren't in it before. 1734, used them up with bellyache. First European-derived epidemic for this band. 1739, 
found many horses, wild horse herds developing at that point. 1757 went on warpath on horseback, first horseback war. 1779, smallpox used them up. And that happened in the following winter as well. 1784, now this is my lineage. My third great grandfather, John, was born in France or Poland. The records are not all that clear. He fought with Napoleon and, and after that deserted and then moved to Canada. 1791, Batiste Good writes, saw a white woman winter. This is the first time they saw a white woman. 1801, the good white man came winter, and this was a traitor that they liked. 1802, smallpox used them up again winter. 1803, brought home Pawnee horses with iron shoes. These are the first time they saw horseshoes. 1810, Little Beaver's log house burned. And this is the first time the log house shows up. 1812, first hunted horses winter using lariats. They used lariats that they adapted from the whites. And now there are these wild herds developing. 1819, smallpox used them up again winter. 1822, star passed by with a loud noise. Now this is when Batiste Good was born. 1824, white soldiers came winter. The band sees white soldiers for the first time. 1826, now my story returns at this point. My second great grandfather Moses was born in Oswego, New York and then the family moved to Minnesota. They moved to Oswego over the border from Canada. They were French Canadians um, at some point. They changed their names too a few times too. Uh, they are hard scrabble. It's a hard scrabble family, poverty stricken and, and altered all kinds of things in order to survive. 1845 broke out on faces and sore throat. It's a new epidemic they couldn't name. It wasn't smallpox. 1851, the big smallpox, and it was the year of the first Fort Laramie Treaty, creating the mapped Great Sioux Reservation. But Batiste doesn't note this. He knew about it, I'm sure. It was big news throughout Indian country. He didn't write it. 1852, first issue of Goods Winter. So at this point, they are receiving government supplements, supposedly supplements, but they had lost most of their resources for food at this point and became dependent on U.S. government supplies. 1854, my story returns here. My great-grandfather George was born and then the whole family moved to Minnesota. 1856, Batiste Good taken prisoner and 130 Dakota killed and prisoners were taken by the U.S. Army. Batiste Good writes about himself being taken prisoner. He doesn't write about the rest of it. 1857, trades with Batiste for furs, a white trader at Fort Robinson he's referring to. So the story becomes more personal as the um, the diaspora continues and people are scattered and force marched and dispossessed. 1858, hunted bulls only winter. There were no cows in the bison herds. 18, the, the ones they had access to. 1861, broke out with rash, stomach pains, and died winter. Another unknown epidemic that came from European descended settlers. 1862, killed spotted horse winter. So this is a crow man who was killed by Dakotas. and But there is no mention of the hanging of the 38 Dakotas in Mankato. That was the same year that happened, but they didn't mention it. My own family's diaries don't mention it either, but I know they all knew about it. 
1868, Batiste Good made peace with General Harney. This is the second Fort Laramie Treaty. Many chiefs and generals were involved, and Batiste Good was one of them. 1873, measles and sickness used up people year, so he knew the names of these diseases by then. 1877, Crazy Horse came to make peace and was killed with his hands outstretched. So this was in the aftermath of Custer's death in 1876. Custer is also not mentioned in Batiste Good's winter counts. The final entry for Batiste Good for Brown Hat is 1879. Sent the boys and girls to school winter. So the children are being abducted and brought to to uh, schools that are supposed to take the Indian out of them, kill the Indian and create the man, supposedly. There were, as we know, it's a tragic history of what happened with these kids. Many died, many were murdered, and, and uh, many lost their own culture. Though, here's the thing about it, what I've learned since. I learned this actually in the camps at Standing Rock, was that, and from, you know, pe there were older people there who told about the story, that it was a chance for very many tribes in these schools to talk to each other. They didn't, all, they didn't have each other's languages. They developed ways to communicate and learn from each other. And the AIM movement, the American Indian movement, actually sprang from this. So the attempt to destroy Native culture actually resulted in a massive, later on, massive movement for Native rights. My story is in 1883. My grandfather, Bert, was born in Mankato about 12 years after the hanging of the 38 Dakota men. So I'm going to go on to, I have to watch time here, I could read all day, <laughs> to uh, the standing room um, where we're turning the history around, basically. We're trying to, eh? Um, I'm going to skip some of this. So we, my friend and I went to Red Warrior Camp, which is the more radical camp at Standing Rock against the, you know, the actions for the Dakota Access Pipeline that was to go under the Missouri at that point and later again through the, under the Mississippi. Um, with the Standing Rock Sioux tribe says no. And this is a violation of treaty rights that we all signed and you cannot do this. This is on our land that you guaranteed to us. Um, it began actually as a walk to Washington by tribal youth and then later grew to over 10,000 people camping out near the Standing Rock on the reservation and nearby. The direct action ended in uh, 2017 when water protector camps were cleared, mostly voluntarily, on the request of the tribal head. Oops. Sorry. Sorry about that. Turn off the phone. So we were in um, Red Warrior Camp, which was the one that held most of the activists, people who would be chaining themselves to the machinery to stop them from digging under the reservation in the river. Uh, lake Oahe, actually, which is on the Missouri. Um, it's not really a lake, it's a, it's a, a impounded water. Um, so here we are, Red Warrior Camp. We found a fence covered in signs and flags with a decorated Mothers Against Meth car next to the fence. A large sign in black block letters proclaimed, no pictures. As we pulled into an open camp space, our camp neighbor, Diane from Michigan, a native woman my age, told us she had just witnessed the dog attack at close range. This is when dogs were brought by 
the security police of the Dakota Access Pipeline folks. Um, she just witnessed a dog attack. She informed us at the same time that we had an awesome camp cook, an older man who called himself Grumble. She pointed to a wiry older man wearing a gray apron and a warm, worn Peruvian cap. He was a veteran of many decades of environmental and social justice actions, starting with Seeds of Peace. So Grumble is who I worked with during that time. I helped in the back lines, cooking and cleaning under the direction of Grumble. And we attended civil disobedience, nonviolence trainings that were held daily. We had chosen this camp because we were following Honor the Earth, the organization founded by Winona LaDuke, an Anishinaabe Ojibwe, if you want to, both names apply sometimes, activist and former U.S. vice presidential candidate who ran with Ralph Nader, if you, any of you remember. So a lot of us are old enough for that to remember that. Um, her mother is a visual artist from the Bronx and is a friend of mine back in Ashland, Oregon, where Winona was raised until she headed to Harvard and into a life of activism. Honor the Earth and collaborators successfully blocked Line 3, the Sandpiper oil line through Minnesota, and I had long admired their work. With native seeds, wild rice harvest, health and social justice for all tribes and actually all people. It is evening and we finish serving a savory meal of beans, fry bread, potato salad, and mixed cooked greens. We eat in the warm camaraderie after prayer led by an elder. Afterwards, around the campfires, we ready for the next day front lines. Most slip off into separate planning groups. I speak with Grumble, who is next to the kitchen, holding a cell phone over which he receives closed group messages. He tells me of an emergency meeting ordered by the Standing Rock Council. I ask, what emergency? And he drawls in his best friendly but low grousing voice. Some people need help understanding the non part of nonviolence. <laughs> Where do we draw the line? Not defending oneself when struck or not damaging property. He offered no details. Amidst the whinnying horses, the amplified sound of a man singing a refrain of a Bob Marley tune can be heard from a nearby camp. You, you all may know the song. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. Redemption songs. That's a good song, says a man, his face hidden by campfire smoke. Indeed it is. Water is life in all our lives. And in this unarmed action, we have our pure intentions and our strong voices as our touchstone redemption songs. This is the basic foundation of environmental action, whether frontline protests, legal suits, canvassing petitions, or lobbying. Songs continue through the night, and I recognize the American Indian movement anthem, intertribal. It consists of, of vowel sounds with no associated words so that it's not a particular nation's language. At time, high calls fly over the massed voices thrilling in its uniting force. Occasionally an energizing war hoop splits the night from those preparing for possible arrests the next day. There were over 800 arrests for this action. In campus, we clean dishes, a man going by the name of Happy and a woman named Julie test their gear in preparation for lockdown to the pipeline bulldozers. I finish work and sit by a neighbor's campfire where a young boy excitedly tells me where the pipeline company bulldozers are located. After showing me the scars of his eagle offerings at the Sundance from the past summer, he tells me the life of Tatanka Yotake, Sitting Bull. Sitting Bull brought the nations together, envisioned the defeat of Custer, refused to settle on reservations until forced, and would not give up his rights. The boy did not talk about how Sitting Bull once had a vision he would be murdered by his own people. And this was at 
at, in, very close to where we were camping on this reservation. Two young girls join us and speak of their own Sundance offerings, their voices soft, more centered than the boys. They also speak of tough gang encounters on Wounded Knee Reservation, where one girl's father lives. Their voices are nearly monotone, matter of fact, as they describe assaults. I consciously still myself to listen. Long black hair framing sweet round faces. These girls touch my heart, as does the wiry boy who is already becoming a water warrior like his father. Flickering memories of my own daughter at their age, also black haired and round faced, along with ancestral ghosts, certainly the ghosts of Sitting Bull, inhabit the dense darkness that comes and goes midst the campfire flames. So I'm gonna stop here. I want to go on to another another river story. We have time, right? Yeah, looks like. Um, so in the aftermath of all of the, the work at Standing Rock, the, there have been ongoing lawsuits. It's still not entirely settled. And Let's see, the last action was a temporary shutdown order overturned by a U.S. appeals court on August 5th. This is 2020. So the environmental rule review was ordered to continue, but the pipeline continues to operate. So I want to go on from here to talk about the Klamath River, which is the river where I started this whole thing of witnessing water, witnessing watershed, um, the the pain and the and the movements to restore. It's a, a place where my parents lived, the watershed of the Klamath, a place my parents lived, and I lived in as well. Uh, it was. Um, and I began working with the Klamath through my own grief, my own deep grief. Um, my Japanese mother-in-law had died, and my father was um, becoming very senile. He and I had had a horrible relationship for many, many years. He was a military man, um, angry, abusive, and... Uh, we really didn't see eye to eye on just about everything, or I thought anyway at the time. So the journey for the Klamath was also like the this is Upper Mississippi, a journey of my own family and my own life, my own issues to witness and clear up. So the Klamath though has an amazing outcome. On that river, there's been an effort to take down four salmon habitat killing dams, and that effort's gone on for decades. Um, the dams are actually going to come out, and most think that in 2023 we'll see the first actions to do that. The contracts are being forged now. So, you know, everyone's like overjoyed. And we hope that it's not too late for the salmon. The salmon are in dire straits, for sure. So I met very, a lot of people on the Klamath. I was especially interested in those who had changed, those who, you know, who were against taking out the dams on the Klamath. The farmers especially were against it. Um, I'm going to read a section from the Klamath. It's called, Who We Are is Changing. Um, I met this man named Steve Condra, who is a many generations farmer in the upper Klamath Basin. Um, 
he was the owner operator of his own hundred year old family farm and he spoke to me of his own spiritual revolution and he called it that he had hard attitudes especially with native people he was a plaintiff in a lawsuit against the endangered species act that went all the way to the supreme court actually it, he was it was in order to change the designation of of the short-nosed sucker and other fish that were important to native ecology and he wanted that designation taken out so that there was no way that the dams could be taken down um, a lot of so often in environmental work the endangered species act is crucial to what actions we can take Protecting a particular species is often the only protection wedge we have for a whole watershed. So the sucker was important on the upper Klamath. So the lawsuit actually was later dismissed, but he had dropped out before because he was involved in these meetings with everybody all up and down the whole Klamath River and watershed, all the different players, if you want to call them that. Um, I don't like the word stakeholders myself, but um, uh, farmers, fisher people, native and non-native, tribal groups, environmental groups, there were many, many, many people. That, and crisis to crisis, dramatic meetings where people would stomp out. At some point, they held some particular meetings to get people to to really meet each other, to be each other, really, to walk in each other's shoes. And those meetings, led by this man named Chadwick, went on for quite some time, and they made a huge difference, actually. Um, he speaks about it. Uh, he, says, he says when he started going to those meetings, it changed him. He didn't, he didn't understand who the other people were on the river and how much the river supports all of us. He didn't see that connection. The river connects, and he didn't see that. He only worried about his own farm and how much water is going to be delivered and why should we hold some back for the fish. But he changed. He knew after a while that we really needed to sort it out for everybody. And he says, we're going to try to sort things out together instead of trying to work things out by suing each other to death. Yeah, lawsuits, there were tons of them. And now, he said to me, Mexican-Americans are, are entering the picture as they progress from farm workers to managers and eventually to owners. Condra envisions a future where local fairs will be salmon, potato, and taco celebrations, which is a great image, and it is happening these cracks in self-images and beliefs, though painful, were necessary to the creation of what would become the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, the first groundbreaking agreement between 28 major groups on the watershed. It was the first of many agreements and attempted agreements to come. It's not something one seeks out without cause, but through desperation and necessity. It takes courage to step past the history of genocide, broken and twisted treaties to create a new agreement with descendants of the settlers who ans whose ancestors took part in the native disposition and murder. It takes emotional strength to feel deep remorse for atrocities against native people that were perpetuated by one's farmer ancestors. It's simpler just to say it wasn't me and it could not have been my kin who murdered or stole. But bringing herds of cattle, setting up commercial fisheries and canneries at the mouth of the river, dredging the rivers for gold, logging off forests and homesteading lands, acquired at gunpoint, proved in the end more lethal than armed soldiers. Um, so 
So for my own family story, a lot of the story on the Klamath is about the fish and the, the salmon and diabetes. Diabetes entered into native lives once the fish were decimated. Um, before that happened, people had about 500 pounds of salmon per person per year. By the time I was meeting people on the river in the mid 2000s, people had five pounds of salmon a year at most, and it was hard to get salmon for ceremony. These are salmon nations. The salmon are crucial and they couldn't even get salmon for ceremony. So diabetes entered, uh, native foods were gone, diabetes entered, the Karuk on the middle of the Klamath, the Yurok at, this, at the ocean, all of them are suffering. They're starving, essentially, they're starving. My own family also has diabetes. It's in my lineage. It's in my grandparents, my grandmother. Um, and it's something that is really a disease of, of indigenous foods, whether you're a settler or not. It's indigenous foods that save us and in indigenous ways of eating. And this is what we now share in knowledge, indigenous science, knowledge of sustainable ways that we need to do together. And this is what is going on on the Klamath. Well, the, so the Klamath dams, actually, here's a really interesting thing too. What brought the final agreement about? What was it? So it was another one of those tricky little things that came out of these amazing environmental laws that we all have that arose in the 1970s, most of them under Nixon of all people. But those laws still stand, even though they've been assaulted over and over and are continue to be under assault, but they are laws. So here's what happened here. One of the oldest forms of life on earth held the key. Farmers, ranchers, fishermen, and reed gatherers call it an algal bloom, but its real name is cyanobacteria, a photosynthesizing single cell organism over 3 billion years old. Over the past few decades, cyanobacteria has shown up with increasing frequency in livestock, watering holds in irrigation ditches. It forms thick mats in reservoirs and along the river in summer months of dusty pine scent. The acid green mats pile up below willow covered riverbanks. With its seasonal appearance, hazard signs are planted along the river. Its decay byproducts poison dogs and wildlife and injure humans. Cyanobacteria thrive in warm artificial lakes, low water flows in the agriculture runoff of the dammed and diverted river. Klamath River Keeper and native ceremony leaders together sued Pacific Corps, who owned the dams, for fostering the toxic blooms, and they won. The process of relicensing the dams had to terminate. In this was in 2009. Even if the dams could have been re-engineered for fish, fish passage as required, it would not have stopped cyanobacteria. In the end, Pacific Core, which is held under um, uh, Warren Buffett's organization, joined the settlement. They joined the settlement. They said, okay, we're gonna agree to take the dams out saying the dams were too expensive to fix. Yeah, so economics also had a, a place. Cyanobacteria was not named in the final Pacific Core document, but it certainly lurked there, hidden in the torpid, stagnant language of the relicensing paperwork. So, so I want to finish with the Klamath story with just a little bit about Geneva Matz. Geneva Matz is a Yurok woman 
who um, whose sons were were fishermen with the tribe at the mouth of the Klamath River on the Pacific. Her sons in the 1970s, which were called the Fish Wars at that time, took a case for tribal fishing rights to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they won because of treaties. The treaties are over the uh, U.S. government rulings because they are nation-to-nation -nation agreements. But the ruling was ignored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they issued a ban on fishing Native fishermen, the Matz family among them, dipped hooks capped with corks into the river in protest, not taking any fish. Emory Matz, Geneva's husband, was arrested. On hearing this, Geneva and her daughter went out in a rowboat. It was autumn, peak of the fall Chinook run. The estuary that ordinarily would be filled with cormorants, pelicans, ocean fattened salmon, and fishermen was instead populated with federal agents in riot gear and power boats. The agents tried to grab the fishing net of Geneva's daughter, and Geneva became frightened. According to her granddaughter, she, Geneva stood up in the boat, held her arms up, and sang. As she sang out her prayer, a great flock of birds came flying very close all around her. Carried by the water, her powerful prayer pierced the federal agents' ears, striking fear into their hearts, and they fled. Geneva's great song has never been stilled. Her great faith in crisis, in this crisis carries into the work of the Klamath Dam removal and restoration the entire decades-long process and its multiple hues of opinion, debate, negotiation, legal actions, and consensus moves forward on her endless prayer. So I'm going to stop reading there. And I want to, before I go on further, I'd like to ask you all if you'd like to speak. Anybody, just unmute. Uh, questions or comments? No? Yeah, I, ha I have a question, Diana. Yes. That, that um, oil pipeline that was to go under the Missouri River, and the, did they ever did they actually stop it or did they go over the river? It went, or under? It went under. It went under the Mississippi as well. It's yeah. now and flowing oil under both rivers? Yes, and delivering to refineries in Illinois. Yeah, because are, are, they, all, all to, people, are yes. they still working to try to shut that down? Absolutely, through legal action. But um, the courts have been back and forth. Sometimes they say stop and then another court overturns that and they start again. And the most recent operation has been that it's it's still flowing oil and leaking, of course. And we what? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's leaking. And but the actions continue. And the the actually the laws favor stopping it. So I have faith that with enough time and action and enough good people in the right places um, that it will block that pipeline just as line three was blocked earlier okay i appreciate you uh, reading from your book i've i've read your book and i really enjoy it so thank you so much thank you appreciate that So what time have we got left? All right. I wanted to go on with uh, the importance of, of ceremony, of ritual, of practice in all of this. And in all the environmental groups and people I spoke to, just about everybody I met who's been long-term, dedicated, 
a really good person and it has spiritual practice. Um, some of them say it's nature itself and some will be Catholic and some are their indigenous tribal culture of, of prayer, but everybody has something. And um, you don't see that in the news, do you? You know, we don't see that. That underlying all of this are people, as they say in Standing Rock, remaining in prayer, remaining in spiritual practice. So, um, So here we are. I'm going to just read this little bit by Anita Barrows about the kind of destruction we're facing and how how difficult that is to feel inside of ourselves and not turn away. I mean, a lot of my stories here too have places that are, that are difficult. Anita Barrows says, And I would travel with you to the place of our shame, the hills stripped of trees, the marsh, grass, marsh grasses oil slicked, steeped in sewage, the blackened shoreline, the chemical poisoned water. I would stand with you in the desolate places, the charred places, soil where nothing will ever grow. Oh, I would touch with this love each wounded place. And this is what we do. We do this together. We witness, we enter into the oneness of everything, including these painful places. I'm going to read a little bit from Zenju, Earthlyn Manuel, in her fantastic book, Shamanic Bones of Zen, when she talks about what is ceremony, what is ritual. Um, she calls it chanting spells, which some people don't particularly like that language it sounds like witchcraft or something but whatever it's you know it's what you make of it yourself one she says oneness interrelationship is an experience beyond our comprehension who and what is in oneness who can say they know that which contains the whole universe chanting is a powerful way to experience oneness to merge with our many voices as one sound is to join together in an intimate way as we do with our breath and sitting together. There's one mind, one heart. Even if we live or meditate alone, we are united with other awakened ones, not only those in our immediate vicinity, but with all awakened beings from past, present, and future everywhere. And you goes on, offerings are made and we begin to use our voices as a place where silence usually reigns. However, we will be using our voices in a different way. We will not be speaking our words. We will not be speaking of our suffering or joy. Mostly we will utter sounds that can light up a dark cave if sung with our hearts. And this is what Geneva Matz did on the Klamath when she sang out. She sang out from her fear, but she joined to all beings in her, in her great song over the river. She spoke for us all. So I would like us to, if we can, um, chant our own watersheds and rivers and um, I'm going to start it with with the California rivers. Um, I don't know if you can hear this. I'm going to play a little bit of a music that was written for this by my friend. Can you hear this? Being one with the Cedar River, being one with the Sweetwater River, one with Cholas Creek, a trinity in Texas, the Rio Grande, the Mississippi, a 
Hudson, being one with the Chattahoochee in Georgia, the Smith, the Klamath, Redwood Creek, Sacramento River, San Joaquin, Pajaro River, Ventura, Santa Ana, Santa Margarita, and San Diego River. And now I'd like for each of us to, in turn, I'm gonna turn this up, um, unmute and chant the name or speak the name of your own river. Go with my hometown and uh, the Mississippi. The Thunder Bay River Watershed Council, I was a charter member. It flows from the northern part of Michigan in the center eastward to Lake Huron. Thank you. Being one with the rivers uh, where I grew up in southeastern Washington, the Columbia River, the Yakima River, and the Snake River, and the lands of the Yakima people. Being one with the Bear River, which flows into the Sacramento. Being one with Iwako Lake that runs through all kinds of rivers. I am one with the small river I live close by, uh, the Billisha Bach, the creek of Billish, which is the name of the village I live. Yeah, I'm sitting on the uh, banks of the of Butte Creek, but I'm surrounded by the Sacramento, the Feather River, and the not too distant Yuba River. So I'm, and the little Little and big Chico Creeks. I was raised on the LA River. So I'm one with the LA River. Hi everybody, I'll go ahead, I'm Choa. And uh, it looks like uh, San Diego Bay watershed. So we're here in the Western mountains of North Carolina. And I am one with the Swannanoa watershed. This is from, from Asheville to Black Mountain. Wow. One with the Swannanoa watershed, where we are working for all the people and all the beings. Thank you for all of that. I mean, the, it's it's so important to acknowledge and our identity with the the waters, the land, with all of it, and and from that place we form our actions out of our compassionate hearts because we deeply love all of it. So uh, just want to open to discussion in the time we have left. There is no um, record of the prayer um, that was shouted by Geneva Hart. There's no- Geneva, it's a song. Yeah, it's a song. It would have sounded so, I've heard the songs from her, her nation, her, she's Yurok nation so it would be a bunch of sounds it might be like hey, 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 like this but very loud and sounds that mean something to her it wouldn't be words um i know her family um i've stayed with them and they carry on her tradition they actually have a yurok owned uh, uh, inn that's right on the mouth of the klamath it's a very old building and it's the first time that there's a Yurok owned inn on that river. It's wonderful. If you ever have a chance to go in those lands and meet them, meet the Matt's family, highly recommend. It's a wonderful place. Could you say her name again, please? Geneva Matz, M A T. T Z, and that Matt's name is on the Supreme Court dockets from the time of the fish wars in the seventies when her her family had this case to protect native fish fishing rights, which were originally protected under the treaties to begin with.
you know, uh, uh, Diana, just uh, just a quick a quick share here, and I, I don't mean to, to to lecture by any means, but having grown up on the Columbia, and I grew up right where those rivers came together, um, you know, uh, uh, the the human, you know, the, the, the these affronts against nature, in some cases, like the Columbia Basin Project, occurred long enough ago that the human perception of them was that it was really for the greater good. Um, I mean, Woody Guthrie sang about building dams on the Columbia River, and it's a beautiful song. <laughs> and it rolls on. And I can sing every word, because I grew up there. Uh, you know, grew up in a place where hydroelectric power and nuclear power converged. You know, probably one of the biggest welfare states in the country at the time, southeastern Washington state. But, you know, almost without exception, all of those dams, Grand Coulee and McNary and, you know, Ice Harbor and all those dams were looked at as being wonderful things because they supplied electricity for not just the Northwest, but, you know, all over the place. And it's taken time for them to be seen in a different way and to remember all of the places that were flooded, uh, the fishing grounds for the Yakima that were no longer accessible, ways of life that disappeared because of those dams. Um, and I don't really have so much of a point as just that observation. And they are so big, and so there's so many of them, and so so entrenched in the land, taking them out. You know, I, I, I can't imagine how that would be done. Um, so that's 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 sort of you know. Yeah. That's my that's my feet in the mud, as it were. Yeah, no, it's a big deal. There's a great book by Mark Reisner about the water in the West that, you know, is all about all of that, all these engineering feats all over the West. And Cadillac, my family, Cadillac Desert, is that the one? Yeah, Cadillac Desert, great book. My, my family, too, they thought the dams were just the best thing ever. Why would you want mm. to take them down? And uh, so those they are involved in that Klamath Dam stuff. But and so, yes, the Klamath Dams are coming out. Um, it's it is the biggest dam removal in the history of the United States. And it's going to be massive. It's very difficult. And these aren't huge dams. This is not like, you know, the Shasta Dam or the, the Hoover Dam or the Grand Coulee, all those. It's it's nothing like those. This is small. And still, it's a massive project to take the dams out and restore the land. And and to find other ways to generate power and everything else that the dams were providing. Huge task. It's amazing that so many, to, from my point of view, so many people have been so deeply dedicated to all of this through every obstacle, they just keep going. It's just, you know, whether you're a for or against, it's just an incredible undertaking when we meet together and try to sort out, you know, how can we save ourselves and the land and all the beings, the wild creatures of it, it's huge. Uh, when I was a kid, my father used to take me uh, uh, in the East Sierras up Bishop Creek, and uh, we'd fish the, there were reservoirs up there. And uh, anyway, we'd fish those reservoirs. But the reason he was taking us up into the Owens Valley River shed or watershed was because my grandpa worked for the Department of Water and Power. And uh, Though he hired on after the uh, Owens uh, River, uh, the LA Aqueduct was finished. In fact, the very year it was finished, he hired on to uh, the Department of Water and Power. Um, that's why we went up there. And uh, LA gets, or at least that was one of the main sources of water for Los Angeles as Los Angeles developed. And uh, Anyway, uh, I think that that area is not so uh, it's well, actually, the Sierras are uh, within are in a drought and the Colorado River is at a low flow. So it seems like 
a good part of Southern California is going to be uh, having a catastrophic uh, water shortage. So anyway, it's something I think about. Um, and uh, I feel like I'm a part of all that, uh, both historically and spiritually. Uh, anyway, that's my two cents. Diana, I'm so grateful for your beautiful presentation. You, it's, you've inspired me to learn much more about the Cherokee experience here in Western North Carolina. And because uh, we, uh, there's a small group of us uh, local citizens here in the Swannanoa watershed uh, working to, and we're using uh, Kate, Kate Rayworth's model of uh, the donut, you know, how to create uh, a social foundation that doesn't overshoot the ecological ceiling. So that's the model, but we haven't done what you've done, which is to go, uh, we, have, we don't have much knowledge of the Cherokee roots, uh, the Cherokee history, and uh, you, you have provided so much poetic and spiritual depth to uh, encountering water and watershed. So I think we're approaching it more from the ecological, the uh, scientific and uh, economic and social. So I want our group to, I'm going to share your presentation with our group and I hope we can go much deeper. Thank you so much. I'll share. Diana. Go ahead, John. I'll share a minute or two about um, a lesson in hope, I guess. The Thunder Bay River that I mentioned flows into Thunder Bay of Lake Huron. And there was a movement in the 1970s to create an underwater park in that area. I proposed to the federal government in 1982 that a national marine sanctuary be created in Thunder Bay. It would be the very first freshwater national marine sanctuary. It was a very contentious issue. An advisory vote was held in the city of Alpena, Michigan, which is uh, at the, uh, not the source, the end of the Thunder Bay River. And the idea was just terribly torn up. Uh, our democratic administration in our state capital was opposed for three basic reasons, primarily because of uh, the thought that the federal government would intrude upon management of state resources. Our most conservative governor possibly in 1980 decided to do some studies or have some studies performed. And he agreed with the uh, NOAA agency. And 18 years after the sanctuary was proposed, it was designated. Uh, 435 square miles became the first freshwater national marine sanctuary. It became so popular that um, just about three or four years ago, it was expanded to over 4,000 miles. Mm -hmm. And the opposition that we ran into uh, would have discouraged just about anybody. But I think the lesson of uh, the success of this sanctuary um, is, uh, is well observed that there's no opposition to a common sense effort to save our natural water resources. Wow. That's amazing. It's really, it's, I love stories like this. Thank you. I'll just say that, well, first of all, the Bear River that I live on drains or its headwaters are in the central Sierra here in California. Um, and I also want to say that as we've been talking, so many of the roots of the difficulties are spiritual. The other side of it is, to me, one of the root problems is that there are just simply too many people on the planet. And what do you do about that? I don't know what you do about that. So John, I really appreciate your inspiring success story. Thank you. 
Yeah, the population stuff is something I go into a bit in, in my book writing because it's always been something important to me since the first time that um, Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb and uh, and also the uh, Club of Rome wrote their, their did their mathematical modeling and all of that. Population is crucial to so much. And um, there are really credible models that given the givens that we have now showing that population is going to peak and then decline and it'll very likely go back to the levels of the 1890s which would help a lot but how we get there is the big question you know it's going to be a hard and painful drop or can we do it voluntarily it's probably going to be both but yeah, it will change. I mean, nature corrects. We're in for a big correction, no question. <laughs>